Now we're going to talk about what causes the object to go in a circular motion. Now we just studied circular motion as in how object moves in a circular motion, but we never talked about what caused it. Well, we know the radial acceleration, which is always going to be pointing towards in towards the center of the circle, and we call that a centripetal acceleration. Well, when mass is accelerated, you're going to have to have force, F equals MA, right? So we know that a net radial acceleration inward must be present for all circular motion, and, and that's very important. This net radial acceleration must cause a net force, okay? This net radial acceleration must, right, cause a net force. And remember what that net force was. Net force was MA, remember that? But since this is a circular motion, this net force is MAC, okay? It's very important that we recognize that, okay? And of course, AC, right? A sub C, the centripetal or the radial acceleration is equal to V squared over R, R hat, which means it's in the radial direction. Okay, radial direction. So this is always going to be radially inward. Okay. Um, okay, towards the center of the circle. Okay. So it's so important to figure out, okay, that net force is equal to MAC, okay? So if you were to think about, you know, revisiting the Newton's second law, remember Newton's second law, just by pure definition, was the net force is equal to MA. Okay? And therefore, we must have net radial force inward in all circular motion. And that's so important to say that F net radio is equal to MA radio or MV square over R, R hat. This is the Newton's second law for circular motion, okay? And this net force that causes circular motion is called the centripetal force. Centripetal, again, means center seeking, right? Which is opposite of center fleeing, which is centrifugal. So it's centripetal force. This radially inward as a positive direction, and this is very important. So inward towards the center of the circle is a positive direction. Okay? Very, very important. Add and subtract the radial direction of the forces that you have. Okay? This especially comes in handy when things are going in a circular motion vertically, okay, vertically like this. So like when you do like a Ferris wheel or if you do loop-the-loop -loop, or if you are like doing a huge loop with an airplane, right, in a vertical circle. These forces are the same ones we have been using, okay, such as gravity, friction, normal, tension, etc. Okay, so it's very important to understand that F centripetal is in a positive direction, and that is our net force. 
Now, when we were doing other problems, such as this one, did we ever draw this net force, MA, as a part of a free body diagram? Did we ever draw a force for this, or this, or this? And the answer is? No, we never did. We never drew these forces as a part of a force diagram. Well, guess what? I hope this is big enough for you. I told Doc to make it one page. Never draw F radial or F cent uh, force centripetal in a force diagram because this is the net force itself. Okay? Never draw this as a part of a force diagram. You set other forces equal to this, just like we did for the other problems. All right? So notice, this whole, if anybody draws this force diagram on a page, you fail automatically. All right? So never, ever draw force radial or centripetal force in a force diagram. Never. All right. Hopefully that's big enough emphasis. All right. Let's take a look at something that's going in a horizontal circular motion. Now, horizontal circular motion is something that we're going to be able to see from above, right? So here is the center of the circle right here. That's this right here, right? the center of the circle. And this 0.25 kilogram puck, right, this puck right here is going in a circular motion. Okay, so this is like sort of like if you're looking at it from here at the, the surface level, looking at it like from here like this, right? So consider a mass, M1, 0.25 kilogram attached to a string of length 0.2 meters. Right? So R is equal to 0 0.2 meters. Mass is equal to 0 0.25 kilograms. Okay. Rotating on a frictionless, this is good, frictionless, plane making 100 revolutions per second. So what is this 100 revolutions per second? This is our frequency, okay? This is our frequency. So here, ten, ten revolutions per second. All right. So for part A, they ask us to draw the force diagram for the mass on both y and radial direction. Okay. So first, y direction is pretty simple because you know the obvious force in the y direction is Fg, right? We know that. Okay, so here is your FG. And then we have the supporting force from the surface to the puck, which is the normal force, F normal. So what's causing it to go in a circular motion? That force is called tension. The tension from the puck pulling in towards the center of the circle is, think about it as, you know, you have to pull this thing, because if you don't pull it on it, if you don't pull this in towards the center, 
when this thing is cut, it's going to go straight out into the tangential path. So it, because it always wants to go tangentially, right, you have to constantly pull this inwards towards the center, causing the tension. Okay? So if we assume that this thing is going to be uh, rotating in this direction, This is frictionless, obviously. So there's no friction involved. All right. If there were friction, right, since this is moving in this, this direction, most likely it's going to be going in this direction for friction. OK? All right, so part A is done. So these are the y direction and radial direction. What about part B? Right, Newton's second law for the x, for the y and radial direction. All right, so for y direction, okay, that's the sum of all forces, part B, and y is equal to m a y. Now notice I did not draw this on this here whatsoever. Sum of all forces in y direction is equal to have F normal. Oh, I guess I could write that in here with F normal plus plus F G, right? So M A Y is equal to now I'm going to consider direction up to be positive. Okay. So it's always good to have that. And I'm going to consider direction in towards the center to be positive. So here, MAY is equal to F normal, it's positive now, minus FG. AY, this thing is not going to be accelerating off the table or it's not going to go through the table. So my acceleration in the Y direction is zero. So zero is equal to then F normal minus Fg. So F normal is equal to Fg. Okay. So that was the y direction. Okay. Y direction. Well, what about the x direction? The sum of all forces in the radial direction, I'm going to write down radial, is equal to m a radial. If you don't want to write down r a d all the time, you could say that as, you could say like sum of all force c is equal to m a c. That's also acceptable. Okay. You could do it that way as well. Well, how many forces do I have in the radial direction? Well, in the radial direction, I only have one force, and that is the tension. So you can say M A radial. Now, the direction of the radial direction is positive direction. So since tension is also pointing into the positive direction, we leave that as positive. So my tension is equal to m times v squared over r. Okay? And that's it. Calculate the tension t in a string, the part c. Okay? Well, we need to find out what v is. We know the mass. We know R, we've got to find out what the V is. So for part C, V is equal to, well, you know it's going around in a circle here, right? So it's 2 pi R F is V, really, right? 
because if you think about it, distance divided by the period is V, but period is one over frequency. So, all right, so this is also equal to two pi R over the period T. But since we already know the frequency, we could just use that. Okay. So the speed V is equal to two pi times R, which is 0 0.2 times frequency, which is 10, right? So what is that, John? I guess we need a calculator. Huh? So, uh, no, my calculator died. All right. Oh my God, my calculator died. All right, I have no calculator. Well, if we were to just say that tension now is equal to, right, mv squared over r. Therefore, I guess if you want to, you can say m times 2 pi r f squared over r, all right? So if you work that out, you're going to get 4 pi squared r f squared, all right? So if we plug the values in, so 4 pi squared, I forgot the m. I knew something was messed up. I forgot the m. All right, so 4 pi squared m, which is 0 0.25 times r, 0 0.2 times 10.0 squared. So what is that, John? You get something like 197.39 newtons. Okay. So Check my math. Okay. If there were friction involved here, if there were friction, right? So this is a big if, right? If right, there were friction, in the problem, right? F friction is equal to M A tangential. Okay, now this tangential is going to be either this way, if it's moving in this counterclockwise position. So that will be the friction, like so. Right? If there were friction, that is. Right? Then you must right, calculate right, and calculate a tangential And solve for VF right solve for VF using this equation. To 
calculate the v squared over r at any point in time. Okay. So if there were friction involved, most likely it's going to slow down as it turns. When it slows down as it turns, your VF will vary depending on what time it is. If it's exactly at a certain time, your speed will change. That speed at that instantaneous time is going to determine what your acceleration centripetal is. Okay? So you can calculate your centripetal force as well. God bless you. All right? So that's pretty much what it is. All right? Any questions? All right. Let's take a look at Gravitron. This Gravitron, there used to be this ride at um, Wildwood when I was very young, right? We used to go down there, and they used to have this huge circular room, and then they used to call it a hellhole. And then you go inside the circular room, and it's really dark and smelly in there, right? Yeah, it's pretty bad. And then what happens? This whole room starts to spin really fast. And as it spins, you get stuck to the wall. Yeah. And then when you get stuck to the wall, the floor drops. As the floor drops, you're still stuck against the wall. And, of course, the painting on the side of the wall below the floor there's like a devil with a pitchfork and flames, you know? Yeah. And then they play like ACDC Highway to Hell, you know? And of course, they shut it down because like there were like people protesting, like, you shouldn't send kids to hell, you know? Yeah. So they shut that thing down. Anyway, this ride, of course, people try to get really funny and then like they try to go upside down or they try to stand on the wall, you know? And then the guy, you know, operator would like scream at them, it's like, Stay down, Greg, you know. Well, this Gravitron works because of, right, normal force caused by the wall to keep you inside that circular room. And you stay up against the wall because of, because of, well, before you go into the room, they tell you to wear a shirt. Because guys have to wear a shirt, girls have to wear a shirt. And the reason is, they would go in there with all like, you know, greased up coconut oil. And if they, if they don't have the shirt on, they would just slide right down into the hell, you know? So if they wear, wear a shirt, it causes a little bit of friction. The friction is gonna keep you from going to hell, right? So, if you think about it, here's friction. Friction is keeping you up from going to hell, okay? So, if you don't have friction between you and the wall, bye-bye, right? And then you have FG going straight down. Right? FG is pretty much pulling you into hell. FG. Now, what's preventing you from flying out and tangentially? Like if this thing is going fast, and then all of a sudden, let's get rid of the wall. What would happen? You'll be going right either into the ocean this way, or if you're here, you'll be going towards those like, you know, t-shirt selling places or, you know, or if you're going this way, somebody else's house. Right? So the wall is keeping you in that circular path. 
right? This wall is keeping you in that circular path. So even though your body wants to fly out towards tangentially, the wall is saying, no, you're not, you know, no, you're not, no, you're not, right? So the push from the wall towards the center, which is actually the normal force caused by the wall onto your body. Oh, I should have used a different color. I'm going to use green for the normal force. All right. This normal force is keeping you in that circular path. Okay. So friction is keeping you from going, let's not write down hell, because if your mom reads it, like, you know, I'm going to probably go to hell, so don't write down, going down, how's that, just write down, going down. You don't want anyone to go to hell. All right. So let's think about how they are all related. Okay. So we know, we know a few things. Let's take a look at horizontal and vertical motions. Let's think about the y direction, right? Y direction. I have sum of all forces in y is equal to m a y. There are two forces in the y direction, and that is basically if you want, F G plus F friction. So M A Y is equal to, now F G, I'm going to call that, if you want to call that positive, that's fine. If you want to do that, right? If you want to call that positive, that's fine. Because it doesn't matter. Because A Y is going to be zero. So F G minus friction. But AY is zero. Because you're not accelerating up or down, right? So here, FG minus friction is equal to zero. Right? So friction is equal to MG. However, what is friction? Right? Friction is really nothing more than mu times F normal. And that is equal to mg. Well, what is my F normal? Well, let's take a look at the x direction now. Sum of all forces centripetal is equal to mac. Now, I did not write down radio here. I wrote down c, as you can see. I want you to get used to both. Sum of all force centripetal is equal to there's only one force, and that is F normal. So MAC is equal to F normal. So my F normal is equal to M times V squared over R. They want you to give equation relates the frequency F with the coefficient of static friction required to keep that person up. So they want a relationship where m times 2 
pi r f squared over r, right? So here, if you were to work it out, you're going to get 4 pi squared m r f squared. So we should plug this into our that. Okay. So here we have mu times, right? Four pi squared m r f squared is equal to mg. So look, it didn't matter whether it was a little, you know, middle school kid, right? Or a huge, like, you know, offensive lineman in a football team. They both would get stuck up against the wall, just like everybody else, because it is mass independent mass independent. So if I were to solve for frequency here, my frequency is equal to, right? G, well, square root of, I guess, G divided by mu 4 pi squared Or if you want to solve for mu, what's the minimum amount of coefficient of friction you need, right? You could say g over, right, 4 pi squared r, or pi c squared. Okay. So, if you know what the coefficient of friction is, static friction is, between the shirt and the wall, right, you have to know exactly how much frequency you have to turn that ride in order for everyone to get stuck up there, right? Or if you know the limitation of how fast you can spin that thing, you're going to have to know you could calculate what's the minimum amount of coefficient needed to keep that person up there against the wall. So either way, you can figure it out depending on the situation. All right. Any questions? Okay. Sounds good. Moving on. Let's take a look at the conical pendulum, right? You know, if you remember at the playground in, the, in elementary school, that tether ball, right? They would have this thing and you like whirl this thing around, hit the kid in the back of the head and the other side and then you know what's coming and the kid cries to the teacher and you get suspended for three days, right? You remember that, right? Well, you shouldn't do that, but that tether ball has got a lot of physics involved, actually, okay? It is going around in a conical shape, and the reason why that's happening is of this tension, right, that's keeping the ball not only vertically supported, but it's actually supported radially so that it goes into a circular motion. All right? So this tension, force tension, will have component the radio component as well as the vertical component. All right. So 
if you were to think about what's happening vertically first, okay, you know this is FG, you know this is F tension Y, so vertically speaking, in the Y direction, we have sum of all forces in Y is equal to M A Y. I mean, I'm going to consider this direction positive this time. It shouldn't matter. So sum of all forces in Y is equal to right, tension Y plus FG. So MAY, which is a zero, right, is equal to tension Y positive minus FG. My tension Y then is equal to MG. But what is my tension Y in terms of tension? Well, it looks like this angle theta right here and this angle theta, right? Alternate interior angles are congruent. So this angle is also theta. So that looks like cosine, right? So ty is equal to t cosine theta, and that is equal to mg. So if I solve for tension here, my tension is equal to mg divided by cosine theta. Okay, so that's good to know. Now let's take a look at what happens to horizontal ones, right? So in the x direction, sum of all forces C is equal to MAC. So sum of all force C is equal to, I only have one, that is Tx. All right. So MAC is equal to just Tx. But what is my Tx? My Tx looks like it is the opposite of my angle theta. So Tx is really T sine Data. All right, so here m v squared over r is equal to t sine theta. So if I substitute this into my tension right here, I have m v squared over r is equal to mg over cosine theta times sine theta. Look what happens to my mass. Right? My mass cancels out nicely, giving me right my v squared over r is equal to G tan theta. So if you want to find the tension, you got that. The speed, obviously, now is easy, right? So V is equal to square root of rg tan theta. All 
All right. Let's take a look at a car going around a turn, okay? A car rounding a flat bend. So this is actually, if you were to think about, this is a big, gigantic circle, right? This turn with the radius r, okay? So if I were to look at this from the, you know, I guess from this point of view, Right? So from here, like let's say I'm looking at it from here, looking at it like this, from the road side, road level, right? I'll be seeing this car coming straight at me, right? So here, here, there's the headlights, right? This is a very boxy car. It's like mobile. Boxy, but very safe, right? So if I were to look at this car coming at me, going around like this, right? Coming around a turn. What's going on here? Let's think about let's think about the force diagram. Well, the obvious force is going to be FG, right? FG is going to go straight down. Right? Here's my FG. Then, of course, we're going to have normal force countering that, going this way. F normal. So what's keeping that car in a circular path? Have you ever, do you drive? Yeah? The wheels. The wheels. Huh? The tires. What happens if this car hits a patch of ice? It's going to go straight. It's not going to stay on the road. It's going to go. I don't care how much you turn that steering wheel. You're going straight. So what's really keeping you and the car on the road is the friction between the tires and the road. That's why it's so important to keep your you know, tires all checked up. Make sure they're properly inflated and they have pl plenty of tread. Right? So. Because of the friction between the tire and the road is keeping you in that circular path. Without that friction, you're going straight into a guardrail or a tree or whatever that's going to stop you from going. So it is the friction that acts towards the center of the circle is what's keeping your car in that circular path. So here, now let's read what they want us to find. So 1,000 kilogram car rounds a curve on a flat road of radius of 50 meters at speed of 50 kilometers per hour or 14 meters per second. Will the car make the turn or will it skid if A, pavement is dry and coefficient of static friction is mu sub s of 0.6? Or the payment is icy and mu sub s is 0 0.25. Well, I think we should just figure out what the coefficient of friction should be at 14 meters per second. If we could figure out what the safe coefficient of friction is at 14 meters per second, then we can determine whether it's going to be going off the road or it's going to stay on the road, right? For example, let's say the coefficient of friction was like 0.5, right? That 0.5 is minimum coefficient of friction needed to stay on the road. So if it's on a drive payment, you're fine because your drive payment is 0.6. However, you know, on, on wet leaves, 
Bye bye. Right. Right. So maybe we could just you know kill the two birds with one stone by calculating the use of s at that safe speed on 14 meters per second. All right. So that's that's the logic that I'm going to work with. All right. So here again, let's take a look at what's going on for the y direction first. The y direction, sum of all forces in y, is equal to m a y, and you know that a y is going to be zero. The, the car is not going to be accelerating off the road or going through the road vertically. And sum of all forces in y is equal to, I got f normal plus f g. So MAY, which is going to be zero, is equal to F normal positive minus FG. So zero is equal to F normal minus FG. Right? So my F normal in our case is equal to MG. That's good to know. Now what about in the x direction or the radial direction, right? Okay. Radial, right? So, sum of all forces C is equal to MAC. Sum of all forces C is equal to just one force, which is F friction. So M V squared over R is equal to mu times F normal. But what's my F normal? My F normal is basically mg. Right? So here, mv squared over r is equal to right, mu times mg. Well, look at this. Masses cancel out. So it doesn't matter whether it's a you know, semi- or Mack truck, or 18-wheeler, or smart car for two, right? Or SUV, mass independent. Mass independent. All right. So let's calculate for mu. So when I calculate for mu, my mu is equal to right, v squared over rg. So at 14 meters per second, so I'm going to say 14 squared over 50 times oops, eh, 50 times g. Now notice I did not put negative 9.8 in here because I already gave direction way up there. So I don't have to give them another direction here again. Okay. So what do I get when I do that? What's my mu? Somebody calculate for me because I don't have a calculator. My battery ran out. 3.4? 0. 0. 0. 0.4? All right. Crystal said 0. 0.4. Four, and there shouldn't be any units because coefficient of static friction is just pure number. So, are we safe on a drive payment? Yes, we're definitely safe on a drive payment because you're going to need minimum of 0 0.4 coefficient of friction to negotiate that term. But what about when it's icy with 0.25? 
coefficient of friction. You're going a uh, bye bye, right? Your car is going to just skid off the road. Michael? Yeah. I have a question about the friction. Yeah. I'm sure you have some friction that goes against this direction of your wheel. So, like, when it's having a sort of. Only when it's sliding. Um, when the wheel's actually turning at the contact point, it is not sliding. So, you're going to need a static coefficient of friction. We will talk about that more in detail when we talk about rotations. When your when your brakes lock up, and if your car slides across the road, then yes, you're going to have to have this friction as well as friction tangential. Why would you have any friction between like cars like what type of rotation? But if it's not sliding, like if it's rolling, it's rolling. Yeah. With if it's rolling straight. There's only friction between the contact of the road and the tire, and that's a static friction. Because at the contact point between the tire and the road, your instantaneous velocity, believe it or not, is zero. And yeah, we'll talk about that when we talk about rotation. But for now, just for now, understand as long as the wheels are turning, you only have static friction that's going to keep the car on the road. Okay, think of it this way. Let's say there was no friction. Let's say there's no friction at all between the tire and the road. Have you tried to drive on that icy patch? What happens to your car? It doesn't move. It's like, and your car just spins out and it doesn't go anywhere. The reason why your car moves is because the friction of the tire acting on the road, road friction pushing your car forward is the action reaction pair that's going to make your car go forward. Okay? If there is no friction, your car wheel is going to just spin on top of it as your car's not going anywhere. Does that help you understand that? Okay. All right. All right. Somebody has a question. Who has a question? I do. Um, can the coefficient of friction be different on the same surface? Like if you're going in one direction and your surface is rough, but like yeah, of course. Your y direction is rough and your x direction is smooth. Of course, depending on like yeah, certain parts of the road they they grade it out into like these grooves and stuff just to make sure you don't go off the road. But it can, it can absolutely. But we're not going to be talking about all these nitty gritty things that could and would. We're just talking about flat, nice flat paved road in this case. But yes, of course it can. Right? And depending on what tread of tires you have as well, you know, depending if you have a really cheap tires with like, you know, bad treads and the design tread is really, design of the treads make really difference too. That's why same tires cost a lot more money depending on how the treads are designed and so on. So it does make a huge difference. Yeah. All right, um, OMG, we're almost at this math car. Yeah, let's talk about some NASCAR here, you know, America's most spectated sport. I don't understand, like, people there, like, going, you know, there to get drunk, and then they watch cars go in circles, you know, go, and go, yeah, Rusty, you know. They wait for another, like, you know, 10 minutes. And they go, oh, here he comes. Yeah, Rusty. For 500 laps. I don't know. America. NASCAR, right? Well, if you ever watch NASCAR, right, and if you ever see that turn they have, it's a nasty turn, right? So in order to compensate for that nasty turn, what they did was they actually banked the turn. When you bank the turn, you can actually go at pretty high speed very safely. Matter of fact, you know who invented this? Adolf Hitler's Nazi Germany actually invented banked curves on highway systems. When they built autobahns, Hitler wanted to deploy his troops rapidly, quickly, without worrying about icy conditions. So when they actually uh, develop autobahns and off 
you know, Ausfahrt, which is basically off ramps. They designed these roads so that when it's banked, this whole road can be completely iced up or snowed up, right? They can negotiate that turn as long as they go at the proper speed that is posted. And it will not slide off the road. So these banked curves are very, very safe, actually, if they design correctly with the proper speed limits. All right. And let's see how this thing works. This is slightly different. This is definitely different than flat turn. Okay. Definitely different than flat turns. Here's why it's different. All right. First of all, this is not an inclined plane problem. Right? This is not an inclined plane problem. I repeat that. So do not rotate the coordinate system. Okay? Not an incline problem. All right. Do not rotate the coordinate system. So here, if I were to look at it, I have my FG. still straight down. So here's my FG straight down. You would think the normal force should be in the opposite direction, but it's not. your normal force is actually perpendicular to the roads that you're driving on. So here, this is your normal force, okay? This is your normal force. This is your vertical component of your normal force, okay? This here, this angle theta is this angle theta. And this is your F normal Y. Right? And this is your F normal X. And your F normal is the hypotenuse. Okay. So if you were to think about it, this is what's keeping the car in a circular motion. Okay? So let's say this whole thing is completely iced up and there's no friction whatsoever right now. Okay? What kind of speed can you turn depending on this theta? Right? We should be able to calculate that. So if this thing were turning, let's say, at 50 kilometers per hour, let's say, right, with a radius of 50 meters, I want you to design this banked curve. So what should that angle theta be so that this car can negotiate this turn without any friction involved? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look. So here... Again, sum of all forces in the y direction first.
So sum of all forces in the y direction is equal to m a y. Now don't forget, this is the y direction right here. Okay, because we did not rotate the coordinate system. And then sum of all forces in the y direction is equal to F N Y, right? F N Y. Plus F G. So M A Y is equal to. I'm going to consider up positive. So F N Y minus F G. And of course, this a y is zero, right? But zero is equal to. But what is my f n y? My f n y is adjacent to my angle theta, so my f n y is equal to f n cosine theta. So here, my f n y can be replaced with f n cosine theta, and that minus mg. Okay, so my fn is equal to right, mg over cosine theta. Now don't try to memorize these things, you should know how to derive them. Now let's take a look at the x direction, right? x or simply radial direction. So sum of all forces in the x direction is equal to mac. Well, I should just made that for the c. And sum of all forces in the centripetal direction is equal to, it's just simply Fnx. And of course, Fnx is equal to Fn sine theta. Therefore, M A C is equal to F N X M B square over R is equal to right F N sine theta. So V squared over R times M is equal to I'm going to substitute this into my Fn, right, which is mg over cosine theta times sine theta. Ooh, look what happens to my mass. So it doesn't matter whether it is like a huge truck or a big giant troop transporter or a jeep or a panzer slide doesn't matter the mass doesn't matter okay so the v and the r right so if you think about it v square over r is equal to g tan theta So this equation gives the design values for theta and v for given r, okay? So if you were to think about it, then v is equal to square root of, right, r g tan theta. So...
right? So if you are working with certain radius for that off ramp, right? With that given radius, you should be able to calculate what theta you should angle this bank to safely negotiate at the given speed that's posted on the sign. All right. So um, if we were to actually try to figure out right, what the angle should be, we should be able to figure this out for part B. So let's take a look at part B. Okay. So for part B, right, here we can use this. Right? So V squared over R is equal to G tan theta. If we were to solve for theta, theta is equal to then tan inverse of right, V squared over RG. So theta is equal to tan inverse of. We cannot use 50 kilometers per hour. We have to use right, meters per second. And 50 kilometers per hour right here is the same as 14 meters per second from the previous problem. So we can use 14 squared over 50 times g, which is 9.8 again. So what is that? So theta is equal to, what's the tangent inverse of 0.4? What you get, Crystal? 21.8? 21.8 degrees is what that bank should be. Now, if you ever see the NASCAR, it's a lot steeper than this. And for a NASCAR, it's, like, it's almost like, like 70 degrees, you know, 70 degrees. So that's like, you could really fly across that turn without slowing down a NASCAR, okay? Well, what would happen now, right? You designed this thing to go safely at 50 kilometers per hour. But let's say you're going to go a little faster than that. Let's say instead of 50 kilometers, 50 kilometers per hour, let's say you're going to negotiate that turn at 100 kilometers per hour. What's going to happen to your car? What would happen to your car? Yeah, Julietta. Yeah, your, your car will, will have tendency of sliding up the embankment and you're going faster than the you know, recommended speed. So which way must your friction act in order for you to stay safely on the road? Down the embankment. You know, your friction has to act down the embankment in order to keep your car safely on the road. But well, what, what would happen if you're like, you know, going around this thing, oh my God, this is turn coming up. I better slow down because I'm Mr. Safety. Right? So let's say you slow down to 25 kilometers per hour. Well, what's going to happen to your car? Then? It's going to, it's going to tend to what? Go down. go down to the other lane, you know? Trying to have a head-on collision there. So when you see an bank curve like this, the safest way to negotiate that is to go at the recommended speed, believe it or not. You know, if you go at the recommended speed, you're safe. You know? So, so in that case, your friction has to act up the embankment to keep you from sliding down the embankment. Right? So in that case, your friction is, again, the hypotenuse where you're going to have x component and the y component. 
Now notice what happens when you have friction. Let's say you're going slower, right? Or let, let's just say you're going faster, actually. That's the easiest because everybody wants to go fast. If you're going to go faster than 50 kilometers per hour, your friction has to act down the embankment so it doesn't slide up the embankment. So your friction actually is going to be like so. So this is your friction. So this friction will have more radial force going this way, F friction X and F friction Y. And your F friction Y will contribute more to your F normal. So you're now your vertical forces are not just going to be FNY, FG, it will also be F friction Y. So you would have to add these three forces for vertically for your MAY. And for horizontal or your radial direction, you would have two forces, not just FNX, but you have FNX and you have friction X as MAC. Does that make sense? Okay. So we will go with that next time when we meet. All right. You should have completed a lot of homework problems by now. All right. So make sure you start working on your homework problems. And we will work with this friction part here next time we meet because I'm running out of time. All right. I've got a minute left. Any questions? All right. I'll stop the recording here.